And it's time for another Techie Talk with State Representative Techie Chan of Quincy Post Nor'easter. How are you, Techie? Doing good, Joe. Uh, thankfully, things are okay in my neighborhood, but I do understand a lot of folks have lost power and uh, had a pretty chilly night. Indeed. Uh, I know you were down at the O'Brien Towers uh, situation yesterday after the roof came off. What did it look like down there? I actually didn't go down. I have a rule that don't walk into disaster zones and other people are working. Um, I don't want to get into the way, but I did talk to uh, Jim Marathis, the housing authority director. I talked to a couple of tenants uh, on the phone and uh, Queen's Asian Resources was providing translation services for an emergency tenant meeting yesterday. So I checked in with them as well. I was checking with like three or four different sources you can tell through the course of the day. And, um, you know, obviously the uh, uh, housing authority has done an incredible job of just getting people in there right away. Uh, to uh, assess damage to the Quincy uh, uh, Inspectional Services and uh, to get the elevator up and running, uh, try to patch water damage as much as possible and stabilize the building on electricity through a generator. The objective was try to ensure habitability and safety of the tenants. Uh, my understanding is parts of the um, seventh floor uh, where the roof came off. It didn't come off the whole building. It came off a portion of the building. It had some water damage. and It had to relocate some residents for a short term while QHA workers are in there, you know, patching it up and ensuring that it's properly sealed. I was told that fortunately underneath the roof itself, they actually had another steel plating, which didn't stop all the water, but it could have been considerably worse. It was entirely exposed to open air. So the roof is relatively new. I heard something between six months to two years, depending who you ask. Um, so there was a, you know, a lot of um, surprise here at how quickly the wind blew it off. Um, you know, some questions about whether there was a lip on the roof that allowed the wind to catch it. Um, as you can see, you know, the pink stuff, there was a lot of insulation involved, which is obviously very important these days on energy efficiency and conservation. But uh, we'll see how it goes. The O'Brien Tower is actually a federally funded building. This is what have always been my very big challenges over there is that the state doesn't fund that building. I can't use state money to address any issues there. It has to be done by federal money. Um, if I try to do any kind of state funds, I actually go to Quincy Housing Authority and kind of a broader stroke approach. but you know, with the other senior housing complexes. Like I did uh, security cameras for a couple of years of state funds of Quincy Housing Authority to upgrade the security to all their uh, properties, not just O'Brien Towers. But in this instance, you know, I did reach out to the, the federal delegation of uh, Congressman Lynch and the Senators Markey and Warren's offices, informed them of the situation. They have contact with Quincy Housing Authority and providing what assistance they can. So I suspect in the next few days as this kind of sorts out a little more at the Fed level uh, and what funding can be acquired on an emergency basis. And of course, the Red Cross is always available to help um, if things get a little tougher and uh, more residents need to relocate. But right now, my understanding so far is that things are stable, but a whole lot of work still needs to be done. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Jim told me that uh, he's going to go for another full roof replacement uh, at some point in the not too distant future. And um, I'm assuming the federal government's going to want to make sure that uh, this time they get their money's worth. And it's also a question about uh, the contract itself. They can make a determination the contract with the roof did a poor job, given the circumstances where we live. I mean, you know, Chris House that could sue, potentially sue uh, the uh, contractor if you know, Quincy Inspectional Services or Housing Authority can make some determination that this is a fault of construction because, I mean, it's six months old-ish. Uh, they shouldn't be popping off like that. And the given its location, it's pretty obvious, you know, that there is a high wind situation over there. Yes, uh, you can walk out and step into the ocean if you'd like. It's right there. <laughs> For people who don't know where the location is, it's right in the edge of Town Brook. You can see the full bridge from the building. And it actually sits right on the water. So a nor or nor'easter like this, when the wind spins the way it does and you know sits on us like a blanket for, for long periods of time, uh, you know, the wind and the water can surge over. So those remember that March 2017 storms, I made a trek out there um, the day after the water actually did recede. You know, I didn't want to try to get myself into a situation where I'm trapped you know, with a car uh, in a flood zone because uh, now I'm just creating problems for other people that really need help. So after the waters receded a bit, I could actually see the damage. And that was a high tide situation in 2017. So we were fortunate this time this nor'easter hit in between the two, ma two big tides. Yeah. This was a high tide situation. We've been looking at March 2017, all likelihood where the, the southern peninsula, you know, Germantown, Adam Shore, uh, Marymount, and House Neck would have been uh, heavily flooded. And likely House Neck would probably be an island again if this was a high tide situation. 
Right. So, yeah, there is there is a saving grace here for sure. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it's inconvenient at, at best. Yeah, and the city's uh, put a lot of money as well as state and federal money into the seawall uh, reconstruction and, and shoring up uh, and improvements that's still ongoing. So, again, you know, this was a high tide situation. A lot of the effort uh, by the city and uh, all the state and federal money that's gone into it would have been for waste, uh, given the fact there's still an ongoing process on uh, seawall upgrades. Yeah. Speaking of uh, state and federal money, what's going on on uh, Beacon Hill? Well, today is uh, Thursday. So we're actually starting the debate at one o'clock. It's about it's a bit after ten now. So at one o'clock, they're going to start our virtual debate regarding you visiting three point six billion dollars of a combination of fiscal twenty one surplus and some of the federal money that's sitting in trust. Uh, I won't lie, this was a little bit of a, a, a different situation because I'm actually used to seeing uh, budgetary items as one or the other in a bill, not both things in the same bill. <laughs> right, yeah. So uh, we, got, we had about 12-ish hours or so to, to get amendments together, and it became a bit of a long night uh, on um, a Tuesday, Monday night into Tuesday as uh, myself uh, and staff uh, just spent a night trying to ha- figure out how to properly draft amendments uh, into the bill. And then we spent a better part of yesterday and into this morning now on uh, reviewing amendments uh, because advocates, of course, are emailing in in heavy, heavy, heavy numbers uh, to try to get me to co-sponsor amendments. Um, obviously, I can't get to all of them. Uh, debate starts in now at one o'clock. I mean, yeah. let's be realistic about this, folks. Email me at one in the morning asking for an amendment sign on. But one o'clock starts the next day as I'm trying to decipher these emails, plus you know, constituent emails and committee emails. Um, you know, we got to be realistic here, people. I mean, it's. <laughs> I think people seem to think I have a small army working for me that has nothing to do but sit every all night long to sort this stuff out. I'm staring at things at midnight, like, what are we doing here? Right. So right. Um, obviously, we're really focused in on um, key issues for uh, Quincy, and we have issues before that the Asian Caucus has proposed, um, and obviously, you know, we have certain key advocates that you know, we're trying to try to see if we can help out with. So it's about three point six ish billion dollars. I'm going to stare at my cheat sheet now that uh, about $600 million is heading to a category of housing. These are categories. We're not actually dictating specific things right. uh, in terms of like targeted, like Quincy numbers. Uh, environment and climate change mitigation, 350 million. Uh, economic development-ish items of 770 million. Workforce development, 750 million. Health and human services, 600, I'm sorry, 765 million. And education, uh, 265 million. However, the way they tr- drafted this bill, uh, even though I described six buckets, those things are subdivided out to another six buckets. So, um, for example, uh, in the housing situation, we put in $600 million for housing. They already subdivided buckets, again, six ways. We put $150 million for supportive housing services. So it's not one line item at $600 million. It's actually six items at the total $600 million. Okay, okay. And, you know, for example, they do um, $100 million for whole, for housing. Uh, for example, in climate change, they do um, $100 million to create an offshore wind development, um, as well as $100 million for water infrastructure improvements. So, you know, it is. it sounds like a lot of money, but when you think about the needs of the whole state, it isn't that much money. Yeah. I mean, this is all, It's is this all one-time money, Tacky? This is one-time money. So the other trick in this is the fact that we're going to propose new amendments. We're going to be drawing down for the remaining of the trust, but right. if they... Given the fact that we're looking to spend the state surplus first, which is a non-restricted money, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, they try to add to the bottom line, which is suspect they might be adding a little bit to the bottom line. Okay, uh, they, they would have to uh, draw some of the Fed money uh, out, but the Fed has to fit in certain buckets. Okay, welcome to the mystery of accounting. Yeah, well, it, it raises the question: how how do these things become self-sustaining after the money's gone? It's none. These are all one-time programs. Okay. It's explicitly clear by leadership that we are not doing sustainable programs. Okay. So for example, you know, I got like two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars for QCAP for an yep. amendment to uh, capital improvements to their uh, Southwest Food Pantry. Yep. Uh, COVID has revealed that you know they need massive modernization, uh, and given food security, insecurity is going to continue for quite some time, given inflation and job numbers and in certain industries are still not back fully online. You know, and Quincy is still a working class city. Mm-hmm. Uh, and food pantry service going up and COVID has not changed how we do food pantries immensely how we change food pantries so 
um, you know, that's a one-time cost. Okay. Uh, myself and the caucus does not ask for any money that is not a one-time cost. It may mm -hmm. even look like a program we look at amendments, but if you think your way through how we drafted it, they're not. They're, okay. They're, they're, so the ones in issue. So um, a lot of people have been very cautious in trying to draft amendments uh, indicating these are non-recurring programs. All right. Okay. So basically strike while the iron's hot and, and, and uh, benefit from it and move on. Yeah, absolutely. And, okay. uh, you know, the, the, the argument we have to make right off the bat before we actually do the substantive policy piece is, is this a one-time cost? Yeah. Because yeah. if that's an area, then we can make a substantive argument to this. Yeah, interesting. Is this, I mean, is this typically the way it sh should be done? Do you think it should be all grouped into one big lump sum? It is an interesting uh, attempt. Uh, I've never seen to do the Okay. Do this and again, I've never seen us get $5 million free. Well, not free. That's completely wrong. Strings tied to it, Fed money. So this this is a little bit uh, peculiar, uh, given the times that we spent a whole 18 plus months now in uh, peculiar. Uh, so uh, every time I tell people, uh, I've seen it all. I've really not seen it all. <laughs> <laughs> Just when you think you've seen it all, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it is a little surprising in the sense of the way it's set up because we did close the books for FY21. All bills are paid. Yes. Outstanding bills for 20, uh, 2021. So this, this extra money we have uh, after rainy done deposit, um, you know, is a kind of a unique opportunity for us to try to address one time issues at local level. So, okay. all right. All right. So it's, it is a good thing. It's just an awkward way of doing it, but it's a good thing. And that's correct. It is a little awkward, but it is, it is a uh, unique opportunity for all reps and senators to try to uh, get some one-time cost on communities as well as beef up one-time costs associated with COVID. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What's the timeline now for this, this negotiation? Is it, is it something that you're trying to get done by year's end or legislative end? Yeah, correct. I think there's an attempt to try to get this done by the November 17th deadline. Okay. It'd be, uh, because the November 17th, we stop formal sessions, although right. Vaughn can, the speaker can uh, continue our sessions past November 17th if he feels he needs to. But he'd like to keep the schedule the best they can unless a crisis right. comes up. So, you know, the House is going to try and get this done today. And hopefully, the Senate does it quickly and it heads to the conference committee. We're scheduled for debate at one o'clock today, and we're scheduled for debate straight through Friday as a contingency on um, this goes deep into the night, okay. into tomorrow morning. Um, for those that ever try to be on the phone far too long, uh, you just picture trying to be on the phone uh, for 1 p.m. and just stay there. Um, being in person, to be honest, can be a challenge, but at least you're sitting somebody next to the chit chat with, uh, and uh, people may catch uh, things you didn't catch in the chamber. Uh, because you know it's a big chamber, and paying attention sometimes things slip slip through. Uh, part of that, it's always nice to have a friend sitting next to you who's also paying attention and maybe caught something they didn't. Yes. So yeah, this yeah. Is a, a, it's kind of a very challenging format, particularly on these type of debates where um, things could be flying fast or it could be moving so slow that we're trying to figure out what's really going on around here. It's, yes. It's, uh, it's kind of like a car with a bad clutch. <laughs> That's a great analogy. Yes. <laughs> what gear am I in? <laughs> Yeah, and next thing you know, you're moving at 70, and then suddenly you gear down to five. So, <laughs> so it's uh, for new members, this is a very difficult lifestyle to operate. Up. But us have been doing this for far too long. It feels like you need kind of get used to the, the way the pace works. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Okay, all right. Well, are these open to the public, Jackie? You can watch us online on the state website at masslegislature.gov. Just click. In the front of the page of uh, the session we'll watch uh, in this case is the house session and you can watch us doing a, you know as much as possible um but obviously because of the nature of the amendment review you know be offline conversations by text telephone yeah excuse me text yeah. telephone email uh, as opposed to in-person chase down of your house ways and chair as well as the house ways and staff so i'm in the process actually now of typing a very short memo uh two ways and so a little bit of short blurb indicating what each of my amendments do to try to provide them some uh, general understanding of what we're, we're trying to accomplish here. And, um, you know, if there's more questions and they like it, obviously they'll follow up phone call or text message saying, hey, we need a chat. Right, right. Okay. All right. This is this is the process. This is uh, this is how we get things done. <laughs> it is, particularly in this world. Uh, as we all know, the building's still closed, so it's still essential personnel access only. Right. And uh, I do try to abide by the rules the best I can, I think, yeah. like tell folks, you know, uh, it's important to try to um, consider the safety of other people as opposed to worrying about your own needs. 
What can you tell us about this um, proposed uh, premium bonus for essential workers, uh, Jackie? We set aside about $500 million that is given to the governor to uh, administer uh, using a currently on the bill 300% of poverty level as the cutoff point of salary. So you're making uh, 300% of poverty level. Poverty level is about $12,800 for a single person. Okay. Multiply out for households, pretty simple math. And then, you know, 30% of whatever that is based on your household. And your salary is, you know, you get up, up to $2,000, uh, uh, kind of a bonus pay situation. Okay. Um, $500 ain't that much money when you think about it. No, you not know, in the big scheme of things, yeah. No, it's going to vanish pretty quick. I did file an amendment to increase that to 500%, 500% of poverty level. Oh. Because several of the public employee unions were very concerned that you know, uh, 300% may not reflect a large enough of the, of the folks that were actually on the front lines. So these are folks that are actually like, in the lines, like meaning people that was looking front facing every single day, practically, uh, where they have a high exposure to the public. Yeah, um, grocery stores, uh, public transportation, um, healthcare workers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so some of us, you know, had the um, good fortune of working work from this format of finding ourselves in an office where it's just you. Right. But it's different if you're, you know, in a high exposure area. Uh, where you're know, constantly in front of people uh, trying to help us out. As I tell people, we should always be very thankful uh, and say thank you uh, to people who uh, get us our food, uh, provide us with essential uh, services, such as um, you know, folks that get us our clean supply mm-hmm. and, and people stocking the shelves. Uh, yep. And I don't think uh, people appreciate them as much as we appreciate them this past year, just as important as... Um, people who are trying to keep us alive, you know, healthcare workers and doctors, yeah. scientists, and so forth. So, yeah. you know, um, you know, we thought we'd try to do something. Uh, we'd like to do something. Uh, well, not you know, giving you like a full a time and a half or something like that. Like, you know, provide something to recognize that we do recognize your, your hard work. The challenge, of course, is that uh, a half billion dollars isn't that much. When you, when you start adding up the number of people that have been out there for us. Yeah, and a lot of them are still unemployed, um, you, you know, even today, and, and and struggling with that. Yeah, uh, you know, the unemployment rate is kind of funky because you know it's floating under six percent. You know, so that's not bad if you're under six percent. It's it's not you know not like pre-pandemic, but you know we were looking at like you know double digits at one point. So I mean, it's yeah. all relative. And that um, might not reflect the true picture either, as you as you're well aware. Yeah, the unemployment number is only based on people taking benefits, not actually people who are not working. So right. it doesn't count seasonal workers. It doesn't count people who are unable to work or, or for reasons. For example, you may, maybe you acquired a, dis- a severe disability, uh, but you are still categorized as able-bodied worker, for example. Yep. That does happen. And some people fall off the grid. Um, right. You know, they retire at a younger age, for example, or, um, you know, they find themselves moving to another state. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it, you know, the unemployment number is always a bit tricky issue. Uh, so, uh, but hospitality industry is still moving slowly, particularly inside the city of Boston. It's hard to find a place to have lunch in the city. A few times I had to go into the office to get my mail and uh, do some office grabs. Uh, you, you know, most of the places in downtown are still closed in terms yep. of restaurants and retail. So, you know, it's, it's getting better. The suburban communities have withstood this better. The, obviously, the Cape, the Berkshires, and some of the tourist zones have, have endured this a little better because of regional, seasonal employment and yep. employment, uh, uh, economic impact. And obviously, the students have returned as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Some of the college communities have, you know, seen a little bit of a, a benefit from from those folks' returns. Um, and leaf peeping seasons now, even though it's been kind of slow because the weather's been warm and the water, trees got a ton of water this year. Yes. Um, so, but when leaf eating season and then we hit the holidays and uh, that's, uh, we'll see how this goes with the Delta variant and now Delta plus variant. I can't <laughs> get what's a plus. Um, and of course, booster shots are, are rolling out. Um, and of course, uh, you know, I tell people sanitation, you know, mask wearing and uh, trying to keep with each other's if you can, uh, just to reduce the possibility of uh, co- uh, contact spread against a person to person disease. Right. So, yeah. So you got the flu, you got the common cold, you have all kinds of other viruses. My favorite is, of course, the norovirus. People love the norovirus. Uh, <laughs> my least favorite type of illness. Yes. Uh, no, it's become, it's kind of become known as like the cruise ship virus, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And it, it does still make it way, it's way around. I had some friends who did pick it up from children uh, who 
exposed to that last year, despite mask wearing and all the other yep. precautions, it can still happen. So I mean, just because it can still happen doesn't mean you should try to not stop it from happening. Correct. Yeah. It's, it's terrible. I love the line when people say, oh, it's going to happen anyway. Well, I shouldn't need to do anything. I'm like, shouldn't you try to reduce the odds? It's an interesting conversation I have with folks sometimes. <laughs> it all depends on your mindset, I suppose. <laughs> um, anything on redistricting to update us on, Tacky? Yeah, we did the vote yesterday. Uh, not yesterday. Last week was redistricting debate, and uh, it was actually a fairly tame debate. Not a lot of amendments were done. Some on the floor tweaking, tweaking was done in the city of Boston, um, out in the Orange area, a little bit in Essex County. Uh, the House in particular I took advantage of people leaving their seats to subdivide it out. One of the drawbacks of having a non-rep in a redistricting year is that there's no interest to protect the seat that's currently there. Mm. So when I leave, uh, and I will leave someday, uh, let's uh, hope that I should time my departure uh, after redistricting. <laughs> gotcha. Yep. So you know exactly where they lie. Yeah. Yeah. So at least there's somebody advocate to try to keep the district uh, intact in Quincy. Yeah. So uh, th- there's always, I get, I mean, this is, you know, people can decide on own, their own career, how to want to manage it. But, you know, we, we have all these eight people in the house that's, you know, departed or departing this year, uh, the house, the Senate has a minimum of um, three members thus far uh, departing uh, this year. Okay. But the same year uh, as they run for election for something else or they retire. Yep. Um, so departure is actually end of next year, but realistically speaking, I mean, it started. Right. So, um, you know, you know, it's it's going to be uh, interesting. Just we basically uh, more than double the number of minority majority seats. The Senate, uh, I'm going to say flat out, gave the pressure mm. uh, on trying on crafting yet another minority majority seat, but also kind of untweet. I won't name the seats because I don't want to be that rude, but untweet a greater minority majority seat out there that was close to the majority minority, but wasn't quite there yet. But they kind of dismantle that a little so i mean i know the papers you know can beat us up pretty badly but they also like pick and choose what they're looking at and mm. you know, do a real full analysis of what was going on uh and you always you guys are welcome at home look at the maps and you know that if you know the demographics of who lives there the socioeconomics as, as well as the racial makeup so you can kind of figure what really happened right yeah if you know if you're from the area and you, you know where people live you can you can see it pretty plainly Mm-hmm. And since we did census blocks, the bill is actually very difficult to figure out because as opposed to naming precincts like we've done in the past, it just lists a bunch of numbers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, numbers don't tell the story. Uh, there's people behind those. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You so know. each the block is a people that live in an area and that block has a series of numbers. Right. Right. All righty. Stay tuned for that. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, things happening here in your district in, in Quincy and uh, events you'd like to attend maybe in the, toward the end of the year. Well, the Dove has their Harvesting Hope event this Saturday, yep. um, Saturday Friday evening, tomorrow yep. evening. So people, you know, if you have another uh, need to donate to a travel organization, a domestic violence shelter in Quincy, uh, you know, would be a good choice. Um, you know, Mark Cleaning Wood Association has the Pump and Spice Festival scheduled for Saturday, but regretfully, it looks like it's going to be another rainy day. I know. So we push it off to the Sunday following, which I believe oh. is November 7th. So up in Bishop Fields, uh, 12 o'clock-ish start, you know, for an afternoon of, you know, uh, family fun. Uh, okay. simple. So the people are interested in doing that. There's the Holiday Fair in House Neck. Uh, a congregational, congregational church. I believe that's the 13th. It's like a nine o'clock start. It's just an early morning, uh, late morning, early afternoon affair uh, there. Notice clearly states that um, that uh, they will engage in some level of social distancing and limited, limited people entering at one time. Okay. But if you don't feel uh, you are comfortable to uh, go uh, partake in the, the fair, uh, you know, obviously uh, they're another organization looking for donations. And as we go into holiday season, the food pantries uh, are going to have a higher intake. So, you know, obviously the supermarkets provide a means for you to donate some food, mm-hmm. like social services, Jerrytown Neighborhood Center, uh, as well as QCAP. So uh, as we head into holiday season, you, know, you have a couple of dollars to spare or go to, you know, buy a can or, or uh, other goods where you make donations and things like diapers, for example, is, is a short supply item um, that's in need for families. No, I mean, you guys can all consider what you want to do. 
Yeah, every organization um, is doing good work. Salvation Army, I know, also um, has programs that you can donate to as well. And uh, and there is going to be colder weather. What does the fuel assistance program uh, from the state look like this year, Techie? Well, we generally, the uh, fuel assistance program, we start with the federal money first and okay. we're back with the state as we go along. I know it's been a bit of a chill recently, but you know, the weather here is kind of funky. We never know what's going to happen. Uh, so, I mean, generally it's about 20 plus ish million dollars we can fed for fuel assistance. You can apply that through Quincy Community Action Programs, through yep. UCAP. It's again kind of income driven uh, guidelines. So, you, you know, you do have to uh, demonstrate you meet income guidelines, but, you know, a CAP agency can walk you through whether you qualify or not. And if you're not sure, uh, uh, you should at least try. Mm -hmm. uh, the worst that can happen is the status quo. Yeah, there's no downside. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, and uh, it might benefit you, even if it's just a one-time benefit. Anything helps. Yeah, same thing for food assistance. I mean, I, I mean you know, it's a food security and SNAP program for those of us who live in order knows them as food stamp program. Uh, you know, the, it's amazing uh, how that program works because it's income driven. So people, a lot of people qualify, but it isn't like you're getting $40 a month. Right. You may get $30 a month uh, or $20 a month. And, you know, that can uh, be a, a good supplement for you to, uh, you know, assist in the higher cost of food. And now supply chain continues to be a complete disaster uh, in terms of cargo shipping into the country. And as cargo shipping out of the country, it actually moves both directions. It's us getting stuff in and us getting stuff out. So, um, you know, you guys all see the news, inflation's here, a combination of higher wages and supply chain is a recipe for more price hikes. And if, you know, if you feel you, know, you, gotta, you can uh, get away without having to get too extravagant for this Christmas holiday, you know, the most important thing is we're all here together right now, given the, the challenging circumstance we had the last year and a half. Yeah, a lot of folks I think are hoping that uh, now with the vaccination approved for uh, younger children, that will you know further lower the new cases and the positivity rate in the state. Yeah, it's going to change the numbers a little bit because the way we've been looking at the vaccination numbers has been 18 and above. Yeah, prior to 18 and above, it was everyone over 21 and above. So, you know, this is this is kind of one of the challenges of the numbers because it's going to look like our vaccination rate isn't that high because right now we're closing in on nearly 80% single dose and uh, almost 70% is double dose. But once you throw the children in, it's going to go a smaller percentage because he's added to the bigger end of the pool. Right. Yeah. So uh, be uh, cautious of looking at these numbers, folks, uh, because now we've added more people to it. Obviously, the percentage is going to shift down uh, on vaccination numbers. Uh, it's percentages of vaccination numbers because the children were calculated prior. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like the odds in the lottery. The more people to play, the less chance you have to win. <laughs> uh, something like that. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, the, but of course, you know, having the adult population and now well, it's actually the teenagers plus adult population, you know, closing on 80% single vaccination and, uh, you know, closing on 70% full vaccination in Massachusetts. You know, it's basically us, Vermont and Puerto Rico, but uh, the highest vaccination areas of state. I mean, and the country, I mean, you know, Puerto Rico's over 80% single dose and well over 73% a second dose. So, I mean, Puerto Rico's uh, an island, it's 3.5 million people or so, but they took the super duper serious, clearly, um, on, on getting vaccinations up, um, and like some other parts of this country. And uh, we all heard the boosters uh, pursuing the CC recommendation. You get more than one, you're over 65, as well as, you know, being compromised, you know, definitely make those calls to your doctors to see if it's okay to be get your booster, um, you're comfortable, you can get a shot like anywhere now. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's literally like every CVS, every doctor's office, every hospital, every community health center, you make a phone call there, you know, to try to accommodate you. And, you know, people still do walk-ins, but they can go to pharmacies. Uh, schedule yes. Not required. Yep. Some are giving a uh, flu and COVID shots at the, at the same time, even. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's safe to do. I got my flu shot as well. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I did that and obviously I will, get a booster once we get to uh, my age bracket. Uh, fortunately, my mom uh, is immune compromised uh, as well as uh, the correct age. So she meets both. And, you know, she got a booster earlier in October. So it was at late September. I'm, I'm losing track of dates, but <laughs> was, I mean, it was definitely six months out. And, um, you know, to talk again about whether we should do another one six months out. So people ask, well, what's the deal with the boosters? So the boosters provide an increase in antibodies. Everybody knows that at this point, right? So the antibodies can help fend off the Delta variant. You know, let's call it what it is now. So we're in Delta territory. So COVID 
you know, 19 delta is right floating around. So it helps fend it off. But after a period of time, because there's no need to fight any viruses, because there's nothing in your body, your body will start to reduce the number of antibodies there because it's just wasting energy making antibodies. So we're doing nothing but hanging out. Right. So uh, obviously antibody numbers will go down depending on the person. I mean, every person's different and, and de- uh, different vaccines. The mRNA vaccines uh, cre- increase antibody counts for longer periods in traditional vaccine manufacturing. So J&J is a, is a traditional process. So does that mean you have no, no ability to fight the virus? No, because the big question is whether or not your body retains memory of the uh, vaccine in the long term. So should the virus show up, your body gears up its defenses because as a blueprint of how to fight it. But as opposed to taking uh, that risk in terms of blueprint to fight it, the idea is that the more people would have high antibody levels, even if the virus hits you, it dies with you and doesn't transmit again. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The whole idea is to end the pandemic status of this thing. Yeah. And uh, by having high antibody counts with the general population, uh, you know, uh, prevents the virus from spreading because if you are inf- uh, you are vaccinated, and you get infected. Uh, unless you get very ill, which there is a small, small percentage, mm-hmm. zero point zero three percent, like zero point zero three percent gets severely ill, something that so, um, you know, the, the virus won't spread. It'll be, you, you, you kill it before it gets any, it becomes very serious. Yeah, and you might only get mild symptoms. So, you know, I've already heard about flu breakout cases with some friends, and uh, the symptoms are extraordinarily mild. Uh, so it does happen. Um, but I mean, they're not hospitalized. They have a real bad COVID and, you know, they keep themselves in isolation to reduce yep. the possibility if there's any spread, if, if it spreads at all in that instance. Yeah. Or it doesn't mutate, which is another key factor too. Exactly. So particularly the older population of higher vulnerability, people have been compromised and you know, keeping your antibody ups at all times uh, is more beneficial. Those of us who are younger have better immune systems, made by memory cells kick in, but I suspect, you know, as they move down to H brackets uh, for booster shots, uh, you know, again, I do encourage folks to do that, particularly if anybody that's in compromise in your life. Yep. As you say, it's free and they're giving it out like water. So there's no excuse. <laughs> no excuse. I mean, even though my mom has a higher antibody rate because of a booster shot, I mean, you know, obviously when it comes to me, I'm definitely getting as well to reduce the possibility that I pick it up somewhere and give it to her, even if she has a stronger antibody rate. Well, why, why take the risk? Yeah, it's it's exactly. We have the option not to, so we should we should use it for sure. Other other places in this world don't don't have that luxury, uh, and I'm sure they would pay for it. Yeah, I had met with the ambassador in Nepal um, in October, and uh, they hit they got hit by the Delta variant shortly after India got hit. And you guys also had massive death counts in a very short period of time in infection rates. And we all believe these numbers are uncounted because no, not every unfortunately a person that passes tested properly and. You know, it's a lot of tests to try to prove what's going on. And yeah. you have to do mobile testing and confirmation. So tell people, you know, well, unless you have to, wasting a test on someone that's passed is probably a waste. It's supposed to try to keep somebody alive. Yeah. But Nepal actually had a very uh, similar death rate. And the vaccination rate is well, well, well below 30%. Yeah. So they're desperate to get vaccine. It's not a wealthy company, uh, not a wealthy country. And the, the country, uh, the GDP is like something in the area like, under 30 million, 30 billion dollars. I mean, message message GDP is like six six hundred plus billion dollars to be mm. perspective. A, comp, a country has a per capita of uh, about twelve hundred bucks a year. So our per capita is like seventy thousand dollars a year. So uh, obviously you can tell the different strength of economy and the different strength of economy and living in a very advanced education and technology country, you know, we have access to the vaccine first. Well I'm talking to an ambassador to Nepal. Um, they're having a hard time uh, saving their own people, uh, you know, under the current circumstances. So mm. We're blessed. We're very blessed. Yeah, I know that the the current administration in Washington um, is sensitive to that and is, is trying, um, you know, to share. I think the U.S. is the number one uh, sharer of vaccines in the world, um, but taking care of the United States first too. Yeah, obviously, so I've seen it in the news as well. We're getting a lot of criticism from the international community, all the first world countries are because of the booster issue. Uh, the idea that you get a booster reduces the number available. Um, you know, the vaccine manufacturers can only make so fast. And uh, the U.S. continues to be committed as a leader of the world to get other places vaccinated again, just to point out, reduce mutations, reduce spread, uh, to try to contain this on a global level. Uh, and uh, other vaccines like Sinovac, you know, in China and others, 
uh, Sputnik V, which, you know, the polling in Russia is very poor on people in Russia want to get Sputnik V, but they won't let any other vaccine in, uh, you know, uh, uses a similar technology to J&J &J, uh, on, you know, using inactive virus uh, components to teach your body how to uh, fight off the virus, uh, which is uh, effective, but not nearly as effective as um, MRA vaccines of Moderna and Pfizer. Right. So again, I'm not recommending vaccine shopping. They're all effective. Um, but other countries uh, that are using similar technologies because JJ, I believe, has better technology uh, than the Chinese companies. Um, you know, if you have enough people uh, humanized together uh, in large enough numbers, uh, even if it's not a very high efficacy, meaning higher than, you know, 50%, it's got to get over 50%. Mm -hmm. The virus should still be very much contained because it has lower places, lower, less places to go and a lower percentage of spread. Right. Yeah. So we're still in it. <laughs> I think we're going to be in this for a while. I, I do understand that, you know, Canada and Mexico has opened up borders. Flight travel, Europe has opened some borders to us. Singapore has opened a lot of places up. But places like Hong Kong is still requiring quarantine, limited access. China is pretty much very highly limited access uh, to those countries. Um, and, the, you know, be prepared, folks. I mean, keep an eye on the, if you're going to travel, keep an eye on the perhaps changing a situation depending on how COVID spreads, but countries like Spain, for example, in France, you know, are closing or at the 80% zone. So they're greatly more comfortable in opening the country. Uh, but if the U.S., you know, has a spike in certain areas uh, because of, I don't I'm just tired of talking about this stuff. But I mean, them um, doing what they're going to do, um, you know, it may result in other countries closing the doors to us for a period of time until, you know, essentially the, the spike passes. Yep, exactly. So all the precautions are, you know, still warranted for sure. But will you be going trick or treating, Tacky? Is the real question. <laughs> I think I'm a bit old to trick or treat these days. <laughs> <laughs> if you were, what would you go out as? <laughs> oh, I don't know anymore. I did watch Squid Games, and apparently, one of the most popular costumes is the uh, the the henchman in Squid Games. Ah, okay. <laughs> And apparently in Korea, the track suits are selling like hotcakes as we go into the holidays. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, a lot of our holidays in America, Europe does go everywhere, including things like Halloween. It's not celebrated exactly what we do. Yeah. But I mean, the idea of wearing costumes and uh, having a party together, you know, is, is tough. Uh, you know, Halloween parties can be fun. Uh, great else. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> It's not necessarily unusual for other countries to practice these holidays, but it's not exactly exactly how we do. It's like the other example of exporting of American culture, right? Our gift to the world, things like Halloween. You know, it's it's amazing how many people, uh, you know, thought that um, that. The TV series, I think it was from the 80s with David Hasselhoff, Baywatch, you know, everybody around the world thought everybody here looked like uh, beautiful lifeguards. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I believe that is the highest syndicated show in the world is Baywatch. <laughs> uh, the second highest one is actually, I think, Green Acres. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. And then I think somewhere in there is uh, I Love Lucy. Okay. Yeah. So that's what they depict all Americans as. <laughs> well, unfortunately, yeah. I think, yeah. I mean, uh, the media portrays what we look like uh, in terms of movies, television, music, and uh, obviously uh, celebrity news articles. Believe it or not, very popular uh, all over the world, celebrity news uh, and sports news. So uh, a lot of impressions uh, of what we have overseas of other people is a lot of my own media, which obviously we've talked about the impact of media and uh, biases against people's race, religion, gender, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, this occurs to us as Americans as well. When I, when, if I ever get to travel again, talk to people. Yeah, uh, yeah. If I ever get to do that again, uh, but I mean, it's it's interesting how much um, you know other people around the world are very influenced by own, our own media, and given the global uh, internet and things like that, watching CNN, Fox News, yep. C-SPAN, um, all the other uh, self journalists. Let's be let's be nice about self journalism. Uh, does influence how people think of us overseas. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, you know, it, it really, it really demonstrates why it's so important to experience things for yourself, you know, before you make a determination or just a, a broad, you know, generalization of a, of a, of a people or a culture or, or a country. Um, in journalism, we call it ground truth. You know, it's actually, it's boots on the ground, see what's happening for yourself. Yeah. And learning how other people see us, you may right. feel put off by it, but don't be. 
because you know the only experience of other folks tend to be what they see in the media provided. The same way we only see in the media provided to them, and sometimes yeah. it is very flattering. And sometimes it's even flat, even though it is flattering, it's a bit of a misconception. <laughs> yeah. It's it's not the norm by any means. That's right. <laughs> no, one of my, always my favorite is people. I find like Red Sox caps in other places, like you know, you know base sports is another thing that transcends uh, borders. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, not every American is a professional athlete <laughs> or, <laughs> or a beautiful lifeguard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything else we should let folks know about right now, Tacky? Oh, obviously, uh, storm damage continuing. I think Quindy's in better shape than most. Ours uh, restoring slowly but steadily. But if you, have, if you have friends that are deep into South Shore and decay, they can be looking at days as they try to remove trees uh, all over the place. And don't touch live wires. You know, make a phone call to to nine one one as well as you know your national grid or, or NSTAR or your local DBW to let people know what's going on. Um, it's getting a little chilly, obviously checking your neighbors. Uh, if you haven't seen them for a little while to make sure they're okay. Uh, but I mean, you know, it, it's gonna be, I think people have to be uh, very patient going to Halloween, unfortunately, regarding power restoration, particularly the deeper in the Cape you go. Yeah, absolutely. You know, beyond that, you know, yeah, just be safe, be well. I mean, we're gonna be indoors a little bit more often. Uh, but that uh, doesn't mean we can't enjoy ourselves. We just should be, you know, uh, you know, just exercise the degree of caution. Um, and I know we've been relaxing our garden. I see it out there when I go shopping and whatnot. I do see it. Um, but, you know, we're going to be indoors more. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Delta variant is still floating around. Um, also, as you know, you guys know how to find me, 617-722-2014. Punch, punch a pad number and get to a staffer. And, you, know, you can email me at tacky.chan at mhouse.gov. I do not need to move and groan anymore to about how much email I get. And, uh, you know, tacky.chan.org for um, some phone numbers you can use. And, of course, take yourself Tacky Chan uh, for some Facebook posts uh, that may be helpful uh, sometimes as well as updating you what my life is like. Uh, we're uh, doing a ZigUp session on November 1st at 1 p.m. Uh, we're going to exact some bills out. So if you want to learn what an executive session looks like, and uh, we'll make some uh, administrative announcements to members of the committee there as well um, to give them a sense of what's going on. I have probably three, maybe four hearings we're trying to line up between now and January uh, to uh, to uh, try to close out the end of like 300, like 20 or 40 plus bills in committee. Wow. Uh, and we're going to start dispensing with these bills in negotiation with my co-chair. So if you want to see an executive session on November 1st on my tech, state representative, Tacky Chan, not Tacky Chan, Facebook, state representative, Tacky Chan, Facebook. It's a public Facebook. You do not have to be a member of Facebook to look at it. And uh, see my co-chair and committee members and the staff as we try to um, move through, uh, getting through a small number of bills on the committee now. And we'll probably have more executive sessions as we continue uh, to agree uh, with my co-chair and, and what to move up. All right. Excellent. Appreciate the time as always. And uh, we'll catch up again next week if that's okay. Oh, absolutely. No, you're, you're my highlight of the week, Joe. My highlight of the week. Wow. I am honored. Thank you. I will say the same. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Halloween. <laughs> you too. Happy Halloween, everyone.